Welcome to Acting Lessons Learned. I'm Tawana Floyd, your host, and I share stories, short stories, of the things I've learned along the way in my acting career. Thanks for tuning in, sharing your time and attention here with me. Whether you're a returning or a new listener, I appreciate your time. Each episode has a primary subject where I'll share numerous events surrounding and leading up to the topic at hand. It may seem like I'm veering off. Just know it all gets wrapped up in a nice bow at the end. This is my fourth episode, and I'm just proud of myself that I am being consistent on this bi-weekly show. I'm still working on finding my podcast groove because I want to be 100% myself when I'm here. But when I listen to the other three episodes that I've already posted, it sounds like there are moments where I'm being presentational. I don't want to be presentational. I want to be me. So as you listen, you may notice that I slow down in some places, or you may hear me breathing more, or maybe have some pauses here and there as I find my sweet spot. And with that said, let's start the episode. As promised in my previous episode, San Diego co-star, I'm going to tell the story of how I signed with my first theatrical agent, James Jones of the Premier Talent Group. In episode 102, I spoke about finding my first commercial agent and how, for whatever reason, it's consistently been more challenging for me to get a theatrical agent. I don't know what that is. I can't put a finger on it. I can't figure it out. And it hasn't just been my experience. I've witnessed it with my other peers, whether they're just starting out or if they have longer resumes than me. It's just this odd reality that it's harder to get a theatrical agent. And that may be my experience and the people that I've witnessed. And there's probably some people that's like, yeah, Tawana, I didn't have a hard time getting an agent. I think maybe my pursuit is a little more challenging because... I'm just not the type of person to sign with just any agent for the sake of having a representative. There are moral values I consider before saying yes to a business relationship, and more so a business relationship than a friendship or intimate relationship, because there's more at stake with business relationships that can put me in an unethical bind. And who's got the time for that? Not me. For instance... I know this actor named Troy who once signed a 30-year contract in his 20s. Whew, 30-year contract? I can't even imagine what that would feel like. And, you know, he said that he didn't know what he was doing in his 20s. And I get that. You know, when I first started out, I didn't know what I was reading when I was signing contracts with agents. And I didn't know that there were unscrupulous people who would actually try to hold you contractually hostage. So I'm not judging Troy. I'm just sharing his story. Because he was in his 20s, you know, he, he was like the hot guy on the scene, and so it was easy to get him work. But once he became 30, there were some shifts where he wasn't being seen as often. And when he tried to get out of this contract with this dishonest agent, the agent said no and compare the situation to gambling. You don't just get up and leave the slot machine or the, or the blackjack table when you've been sitting there for hours because at some point you're going to hit the jackpot. Ugh, imagine being an actor in that position. I don't know what I would do in that position. Actually, you know what? I would quit the business just out of spite because who gets to own me for 30 years? I'd rather not work and you just hold that contract if I can't fight it and get out of it. The idea of this makes me sick to my stomach. Fortunately for Troy, the representative died. Yeah, I say fortunately because I get it. It sounds awful that someone lost their life. But come on, man, that's just treacherous. So how do you deserve to keep your life when you are signing people to 30-year contracts? I know I'm not God, but I hope you understand what I'm saying here. Troy was able to find a reputable agent and has had a lucrative television career still prospering to today. And he'd probably want me to tell you that if you don't know what a contract says, it is worth employing a lawyer and paying, I don't know, $200 to $500 an hour to have them read that contract and tell you what it says. If a talent agency isn't bonded or licensed by the state or maybe even franchised by SAG-AFTRA, it's possible that they are up to no good. And even those protections can't stop the corrupt agent from operating out of integrity. 
I recently listened to a Q&A where an actress, now a series regular, shared a story of her early agent skimming her commissions for years. Not just hers, everybody on his roster. She didn't even realize it. One of her agency mates brought it to her attention. What a creep. But look, this episode is not about agent scare tactics. I'm communicating why I don't partner with just any agent. I desire to collaborate with credible agencies known for their distinctive reputations and long-standing legitimate offices, so it's essential for me to be in business with people I like and respect. Some of my peers don't care if they like or respect their representatives or that their representatives respect them back. They only care that the agent gets them auditions so they can book. I can't function in that manner. If I dislike someone... It shows, and it's hard for me to remain cordial. I just don't want my brand attached to a detestable persona. I'll share a quick story of an agent I had in New York who was brusque, irascible, and had the nerve to speak to me like I was the help. It was 2003. I was taking this actor marketing program, and so I told my coach how much I couldn't stand this agent. He knew the agent personally, and he knew that she was difficult, and she had a reputation in town for being difficult. I don't understand how the industry allows these bad behaviors to continue on. I told my coach that I had enough with her, and I was going to terminate her. And he said, no, Tawana, don't do that. Your career is just starting. This agent might be the person they get you a game-changing audition. Now, this was before cell phones were practical. So he suggested that I not take her calls directly and that any time she called or paged me, I returned her calls after business hours, which worked. But who wants to have a relationship like that? I don't. And by the way, nothing groundbreaking came through her. People did not like her. I would never do that again. I'm interested in reciprocal relationships with my agents. Finding James Jones didn't come from a standard submission of a headshot, resume, and cover letter. Our encounter was entirely unconventional. But before I get into that, let me delve into the assembly of affairs that led me to meet him. I was coaching a self-expression leadership program at the Landmark Forum. Okay, okay, I can sense there are listeners that are like, ugh, the Landmark Forum. There may be some that feel like, hey, we have that in common. And I'm sure most are like, what the heck is a Landmark Forum? Either way, I just want you to know that this is not a recruitment episode. I'm just going to share really quickly what I was doing at the time. And without making this an enrollment conversation, enrollment, which is jargon of the forum, I'll simply state, the Landmark Forum is a three-part personal development program using the intellectual property of Werner Erhard. It's known to be both an advantageous self-improvement education and, well, a cult. (laughs) I know, some people are thinking, a cult? WTF, Tawana? (laughs) But look, if you read the general definition of a cult, and if we're being honest with ourselves... We've all more than likely been a cult member at some point in our lives. And like me, you probably didn't stay long enough to become what we know as fanatics. And even if you did, that is your business. No judgment here. Cults work for some people, but I'm off topic. There are three intensive phases of the Landmark Forum. The final stage is the Self-Expression Leadership Program, which I'll be referring to as SELP. In this last component of the program... Members expand their natural capacity for leadership and become unstoppable, expressing thoughts and ideas that call forth the alignment of cooperation and partnership of others. The members of the SCLP create a project that will positively impact people of a chosen community. Stated plainly, I learned how to become a leader by putting my ideas into action and asking others to help me while we help others while I was in this program. And I enjoyed this course so much that after I graduated, I signed up to become a coach. And in natural landmark fashion, coaches support their teams by being in the game of doing. So that meant I too had to create a project. And I knew I wanted my project to be actor-centric, but I was uncertain about what I would do. 
Now, this was pretty early on in my arrival to L.A., and I was looking for ways to meet people, to meet working actors, and learn the makings of Hollywood. So I was also a member of the Women's Committee and the EEO Committee at my union, AFTRA, which had not yet merged with SAG. One of the responsibilities for both committees was a monthly meeting where the chairs of the committee and the committee members would sit around and pitch ideas for unprecedented educational events to benefit AFTRA members. The women's and EEO committees were led by two emboldened, egalitarian veteran actors, Patricia Darbo and Jason George. If you know them, you know they both are really good at leadership. I admired Patricia and Jason's passion for the members of AFTRA. Both were explicitly endowed with this ability to make people feel heard. They listened and they regurgitated what they would hear back to the people. They both harness a magnetism that drew people to them. And as a result, they made a lot of things happen for actors. Between the two committees and the SELP, I was in my leadership learning stage. While I wasn't clear what my SELP project would be, I knew it would be beneficial to my team and my personal understanding to decide on a project early on in a 16-week course so that I could get coaching at every step. Now that I was around working actors more often, I'd frequently hear this statement, is your agent getting you out? Followed by, my agent isn't getting me out. It seemed like such an odd question to ask. The statement most times seemed to come from a place of despair than random curiosity. I didn't see how it was valuable for another actor to know what my agent was doing. I mean, what was happening for me was meant for me, and I assumed vice versa for them. Now, before hearing this statement, I was content with my journey. I only had a commercial agent at the time, but things were evolving nicely for me, or So I thought, because any time I'd engage in conversation around this statement, is your your agent getting you out? My agent is getting me out. I'd learned that my audition ratio and comparison were a fraction of what my peers had. So I couldn't understand why they were so concerned when they were seemingly doing well. Hearing Hearing their numbers versus mine made me feel deficient because... I wasn't getting anywhere near my colleagues' opportunities, but I also wasn't asking the question, is your agent getting you out? Maybe because I didn't have a theatrical agent. Because my commercial agent was definitely getting me out. Uh, My my agent isn't getting me out. Is your agent getting you out? My agent isn't getting me out. Is your agent getting... This had my wheels turning. I'd hear this statement whenever I was in the presence of actors. It made me uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable. I resented being asked that question. I still do. I remember feeling sorry for my peers. They seemed so disempowered. And I couldn't help but wonder, when did we jump to the conclusion that our agents weren't trying to get us out? I mean, were we doing all in our power to help our agents get us out? And why weren't we having these conversations with our agents? What if it were all just a big misunderstanding, something that we created in our head and collected evidence to support it as true? My agent isn't getting me out. Hmm. I decided my project would be, my agent isn't getting me out. This is how I would serve my community of actors. Check two boxes, complete my SELP project, and fulfill upon my committee duties. I settled on making it a one-night panel discussion comprised of two commercial and two theatrical agents. I wanted the information to come from well-known and respected agencies. I knew by doing this, more AFTRA members would be in attendance. I intended for us, actors, to have a conversation and get on the same page with our agents. I wanted my peers to stop feeling unworthy and begin talking to their agents. Anyone who's worked pretty much any job, corporate sales, restaurants, we know that there's always a peer review. Perhaps this is what was missing between actors and agents. A touch base, a peer review, a get on the same page. I had a good relationship with AFTRA's then director of member education, Consuelo Flores. 
Consuelo was, Consuelo is another brilliantly masterful leader. And she was the person who'd approve and schedule events. And usually the calendar would be six to 12 months out. So I wanted to get to her to schedule this event. I reached out to her for a meeting and she invited me to her office where I was able to pitch my idea to her because I didn't want to run the risk of it being talked out of oblivion in the committee, which happened a lot. I felt it was wiser to pitch directly to her to get the project approved. Consuelo was immensely supportive and excited about the event. She began brainstorming ideas on how to make the event a success. Then she asked me who I wanted to have moderate the panel. Well, I had already decided to ask Jason George because he's a phenomenal speaker and knows how to cover all the information bases. And before I could say his name, Consuelo said, I think you should moderate, Tawana. What? Uh, No, not me. Okay, I remember my hearing starting to go into this high-pitched frequency, and I felt like I was being turned upside down, like my vision was being blurred, like a, 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 a an Instagram vignette filter. And when I became present and back into the room, Consuelo said, I think you should moderate because I watch you in meetings. You don't say much, but when you do, you say something that's valuable. You don't talk just to hear yourself speak. I I didn't know. I didn't think that I had the recognition to tackle such an enormous task. But Consuelo went on to say, Tawana, you're very thoughtful and reserved. I believe in you. I think you should moderate. (sighs) Consuelo had a point. This was my project, and I did have an agenda in mind to empower my peers. Also, one of the tenets of the SEOP was to push past our fears, be unstoppable, and step into leadership boldly. So I said yes to moderating. She approved the project, and we scheduled it for a date that was close to the end of my SCLP program. But we still had to bring it to the committee for feedback. And I was nervous about that because presenting to a room of committee members, ah, it just seemed daunting. I was mostly quiet during committee meetings. I listen intently and weigh the information before offering my two cents. And lots of times... I didn't have anything to offer, so I didn't know what they thought of me in terms of creating a project and leading it. At the committee meetings, we first dealt with old business and then introduced new business. Based on members' schedules, there could be anywhere from 10 to 20-something members plus staff in a room. So when we got to new business, Consuelo announced Tawana has a project scheduled, and then she invited me to share it with the members. I was new at pitching, especially in a room full of people, so I don't, I don't know how coherent I was or how long it even took me to pitch the project. I just remember I felt supported in the room. I fielded questions, we brainstormed further, and then Jason George gave me the most meaningful note. He said, mm, Tawana, I don't know, my agent isn't getting me out. It kind of sounds accusatory of the agents, and it might make it hard for them to participate in the panel. We don't want them to think it's a witch hunt. And then he suggested, how about add an ellipsis and other misconceptions to form? My agent isn't getting me out. Ellipsis and other misconceptions. Ah, What an emphatic title. From what I could tell, the committee members were on board, and now I needed help getting the agents. I already planned to ask my boss lady commercial agent, Angela Strange, from Osbrick Agency. And then Jason George offered to ask his then theatrical agent, Harry Gold of TalentWorks, which was huge. Another committee member, David Westberg, offered to ask his buddy from CESD, commercial agent David Ziff. All three of those agents responded and committed rather quickly. I decided it would be a good idea to add an acting career strategist. Consuelo found Jessica Sidemer, who was able to be the strategist. Now I just needed one more theatrical agent. If you've been listening to my past episodes, you know I often speak about providence and how it always shows up at the ideal time. And that is exactly what happened here. I was on Facebook and saw a State of the Union post reframed as the State of Hollywood. 
It was by James Jones, which I didn't know at the time. And this was on the heels of the 2008 writer strike. The strike, while very much needed, shut down Hollywood. Businesses closed. Actors who worked often had no work. Crew members. It, like, really shut the place down. The writers ended up bargaining a pretty decent contract. But what happened is it changed the industry. And I can only really speak from the actor side. So what the State of Hollywood Address talked about was the impact of film stars who pretty much frowned on working television were now transitioning to work in television. So they started taking series regular roles, recurring and guest star roles, which caused a degradation for the blue collar actor. The working class actor who usually book series regulars and recurring roles, were now bumped down to guest stars and co-stars. And then the co-stars were struggling to even get a co-star. I view James' State of Hollywood address to be like a love letter to actors. He was telling us what was happening that it was out of our control, but not to worry and not to fret, and here are some ways to circumvent this. This was information we weren't privy to. It included a review of the past pilot season, The Winners and the Losers, an overview of the new pilot season by network and genre, demographics of all series regular roles offered by gender, age, and ethnicity, the stratification of every actor who booked a series regular role, and an analysis of the top players, agencies, management firms, law firms, and publicists. It was a comprehensive letter. And I needed this guy for my panel, but I didn't know how I would get him. And I was terrified to cold call him. So I used the call after business hours method and left a message. I thanked him for his state of the Hollywood address, invited him to participate in my panel in conjunction with AFTRA, I shared who was already slated to participate, ending my call with contact information if he were interested. I was so proud of myself because making that call was a bold move for me at that time. I just knew he would call the next day. He didn't. So that meant I had to actually follow up during business hours. Now, let me preface. I had worked in luxury sales for 10 years. I earned a six-figure income from cold calling leads. I knew how to pick up the phone and enroll people, but I was scared to make this call to James because actors are always told, don't bother agents, don't bother casting directors, don't call us, we'll call you. I just remember being constantly programmed to forego standard business tactics when it came to agents and casting directors and being made to feel like a nuisance if we did contact them. But I had to get over myself. This was important because it would serve my community of actors to hear what James had to say. And the only thing that was in the way was a phone call. I didn't want to waste his time once I got him on the phone, so I wrote a mini-script I called. The reception answers and asks the nature of the call. I told her I left a message the night before about the panel and that I'm now following up to see if James would be interested. With great enthusiasm, she voiced, Oh, oh, yes, yes, he wants to do that panel. Hold for James. Hold, hold on. That was all I needed to reduce my fear. I got to James. I read my script. And he jovially agreed to participate. I did it. I had my final panelist. Two of my SELP coaching buddies were very excited about my project and wanted to support me with their presence. The panel was for AFTRA members only, but we were able to invite them to attend. It felt good having them there, too. As actors filed into the room on the day of the panel, Jason George came to me with supportive words of wisdom and an atta girl. He stood in the back the entire time. He and my SELP peers were the beacons of grounding when I get nervous. It was a sold-out house, standing room only. I had no time to be afraid. I had a mission to disseminate information that would empower my actor peers to initiate collaborative and communicative partnerships with their agents. I couldn't have chosen a better group of panelists. They spoke about how much it cost the agency to represent an actor, 
how most actors don't give the agents the requested materials, like headshots, taking a particular class, booking out, or informing the agent when the actor has a significant event that will be useful for pitching. The agents communicated how they individually like to be in partnership with actors. I was surprised to learn the agents wanted more participation than not, that they didn't like feeling like they cared more about the actor's career than the actor did. It was a successful event. I had actors thanking me for the information for weeks. One woman stopped me in Starbucks to thank me and informed me that she had a meeting with James for representation. What? I, I didn't, it didn't occur to me to ask for a meeting. Y'all, sometimes I'm such a late bloomer. I knew I wouldn't ask Harry Gold for a meeting because I was developmental, just starting, no credits at all, and Harry's roster was full of recurring and series regulars. But James's roster had varying levels of actors. I have to believe Providence had that woman share this news with me so that I could do the same. Ask James for a meeting. And so I did. And he said, absolutely, we're comrades now. I went to James's office in the valley. It was a medium-sized office, elegantly decorated with royal blue walls. Our conversation ranged from Hollywood business to personal stories. He shared that at age 22, he was the youngest tactician and strategist for George H.W. Bush. We talked about relationships and how his wife was a captain of industry in her field, and that meant she couldn't leave Seattle and come to be with him in Los Angeles. I shared with him my experiences with long-distance relationships and how it was almost impossible for me. I asked him how a long-distance relationship was working for him. He said it didn't, and that they were trying their best. That transparent moment endeared me to him. James said he didn't subscribe to the idea that if two actors look alike, he can't rep both. He believed no two actors were the same, even if they were identical twins— those twins would have different takes on the material. We ended with him saying that he would take the weekend to look at my materials and compare and contrast his roster, but that he'd be in touch either way. He contacted me the following week to say, while I had no credits, he admired my gumption to create a high-profile panel to help actors. That cold calling him spoke volumes to the professional I am. He offered to sign me, and I accepted I signed my contract on June 25, 2009. I'll never forget that date because when I arrived to the office, the receptionist asked me if I heard the news that Michael Jackson had died. I stayed with James for four years. He got me my first television credit. If you're interested in hearing that story, listen to episode 103, San Diego Co-Star. James and I had a great relationship. And then I noticed a shift in his behavior. Where he was once very communicative, it became increasingly difficult for me to get fundamental commitments from him. Towards the end of our relationship, he had asked me for new headshots, and when I got them, I sent him the session. It took him weeks to choose the photos he liked, and he still didn't choose them. He had his assistant choose them. He told me he was no longer submitting for co-stars and that he had changed his office to guest stars only. And that was exciting, but when I asked if he felt I would get invited to guest star auditions, he gave an obligatory, well, we'll see. And then he stopped responding to my emails. Now, I've heard it said that if your agent doesn't respond to your emails, you have no agent. But I heard that later. I know the thrill is gone when there is a shift in pattern or consistency of behavior. People are people no matter what the relationship is. James was a kind guy normally, so I think that once he changed his business model, he didn't have the heart to say I was no longer a fit. I asked for a touch-based meeting. He obliged with a, sure, email me in April and we'll get to gabbing. That conversation never happened. So, on June 10th, 2013, I sent an email thanking him for the years spent in partnership and for my first TV credit. I explained that I sensed a shift in interest, so I terminated the contract. His response, and I quote, No worries, T. Best of luck as you move forward. One thing about me, I know when to leave a situation that is no longer working. I didn't even have another agent. 
I just value my peace of mind over everything. If I'm constantly wondering what's happening with my relationship with someone, I view that as an energy leak. And I end the relationship. Because life is too short. James closed the doors of Premier Talent Group. I don't know precisely when, maybe two or three years after I left. Perhaps it was hard for him to make ends meet. Maybe that's why he was becoming distant. I could speculate all kinds of stories, but I won't. I just find it odd that he's entirely off the grid. Even after I left, we would exchange commendations on LinkedIn, but he's not even there anymore. Hollywood is such a mysterious place. People just disappear, almost like they never existed. Wherever James Jones is, I hope he's thriving. I hope he and his wife are able to reconcile their relationship. I hope he's alive. So what did I learn from this experience? I learned how to be a leader of my career, how to make and take bold choices, that people will support you when you're doing something worthwhile in the world. To ask, I learned learned to ask for what I want, and sometimes the answer will be yes, that I'm credible for moderating panels, and to leave when it's time to go. (sighs) That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you learned something new, won't you please subscribe or follow? The impressions increase the possibility of monetizing this labor of love. If you want to know more about me, you can follow me on Instagram at actinglessonslearned or at quirkyful. And you can also go to my website at tawanafloyd.com. Please feel free to share this podcast with any actor who you think may enjoy it. That's it for this episode of Acting Lessons Learned. Thank you for listening. And remember, I'll always remind you to follow your intuition. It always knows best.